What is the story of Christmas really about? You know, we know the basics. We've got the character straight. We've got the places straight. Bethlehem, Mary Joseph, stable manger, shepherds, angels. Check on all that. Sometimes I wonder as the years go by whether or not we're truly gripped with wonder at the Christmas story and what it tells us about the character and the plan of God. And so there's something so appropriate about having children retell the Christmas story. Recapturing wonder at familiar things in my life has often been accomplished through my kids. And I think these kids have done a remarkable job, don't you? Yeah. Many people read the Bible as if it was a kind of Aesop's fables. Did you ever read Aesop's fables? Short, memorable tales with a moral at the end. A lot of people read the Bible that way. But I would ask you to consider the Bible as a single story. It's not a collection of isolated stories. It's a single, unified story. So if that's the case, then we really can't understand the Christmas story without understanding what comes before it. Once upon a time, there lived a man and a woman they were the happiest human beings who have ever lived. God had made them in His image and likeness, little mirrors that reflect the character and the ways of God. And like everything else God had made, He made them exceedingly good. One very bad day, Adam and Eve ate from the one tree God told them not to eat from. Adam and Eve's disobedience really messed them up. And it really messed up all of creation. And not only had Adam and Eve become the kind of people who no longer reflect God's character and ways, they could no longer stay in the paradise God had made for them. And so they were expelled. The beginning of the story sets up a tension that Christmas significantly resolves. If you're reading the Bible as a single story, you're probably asking two fundamental questions. The first is, how do human beings once again enter and live in God's dwelling place, paradise? The second is, how do human beings become what God had originally created them to be? See, there were two problems. Because of their sin, Adam and Eve weren't where they were supposed to be, and they weren't who they were supposed to be. And much of the rest of the Old Testament follows the ups and downs of a nation, Israel. But very early in Israel's existence, God had given them laws to live by. 613 to be specific. 613 laws to live by. And if Israel could faithfully live these out, they would once again be the kind of people God had originally created human beings to be. And by being the kind of people God originally created them to be, they would permanently enjoy where they were supposed to be, in the presence of God. But the Old Testament reads like the movie Groundhog Day. The details differ slightly from day to day, but the result is the same. They can't do it. They wake up each morning... And they live through another day of failures. In order to deal with their failures, God institutes a sacrificial system where some poor, unfortunate animals would be blamed for the sins of the people and sacrificed. Now, the Old Testament, while it's primarily about Israel, it actually tells humanity's story. The Old Testament tells your story. Sin separates us from God's dwelling place. It separates us from paradise. It raises the problem of how we ought to be held accountable for our failures, and it prevents us from being the kind of people God created us to be in the first place. So how does Christmas help us with these problems? Jesus lived roughly 33 years on this planet. Why? Why not come to earth on a Friday as a grown man? He can do that. He's God. Why not come to earth on a Friday as a grown man? 
die, come back to life on Sunday. Take care of the cross business, all the cross business in a single weekend. Very 21st century thing to do, right? Get it done. Just get it done. Well, the answer is we don't just need the death of Christ. We need the life of Christ. Let me put it this way. Christians will be saved by works. Christians will once again enter the dwelling place of God, paradise, by works. The question is, by whose works will you be saved? If you're banking on being saved by your works, you will be stuck in a perpetual spiritual groundhog day. But part of what it means to be a Christian is that you're banking on being saved by Jesus' works. So on that Christmas day, Jesus began to live the perfect life we should have lived but failed to. And that sacrificial system I mentioned earlier, you know, where some poor unfortunate animals got blamed for the sins of the people, Jesus became our ultimate sacrifice, dying in our place the death our sins rightly deserved. So two questions that you must answer and two questions that I think should fuel our wonder at Christmas time are this. The first is, by whose works will you enter God's dwelling place? Yours or Jesus's? Second question, who will pay for your sins? You or Jesus? I hope the answer is obvious. But someone might be thinking, how? How does Jesus do this? How can I be assured I'll enter the dwelling place of God by the works of Christ and the death of Christ? Really, what you're asking is, what is a Christian? It's interesting, the word Christian is used only three times in the Bible. Twice in Acts, once in 1 Peter. Seems a bit strange for how often we use that term. The New Testament writers had a different way of describing Christians. They would use the